Well, got a little out of sequence this morning, but I guess that's okay. Uh, yeah. We, uh, I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But uh, I, uh, I did fail to mention one thing uh, on, on the prayer request part of it, and this is significant. Uh, I just want to remind everybody to continue to pray for the general conference that's happening next week uh, and the votes that are going to be taking place uh, concerning all the things that's going on in the Methodist Church right now. Um, that's on a big, on a, on a global scale. Um, but uh, certainly it could have global impacts, but from a, from a local scale, local standpoint, I, uh, I was able to meet uh, on Friday uh, the pastor of Union Baptist number three out on the center highway. Uh, Brother Joey out there uh, is, uh, I've been hearing a lot about him. Uh, one of my bosses uh, attends church out there and uh, they're a happening church, got a lot going on. Um, love the Lord and uh, God's blessing them and doing, doing a lot of great things out there. And, and, and as we were talking on Friday, he, uh, he asked me to mention in church that, uh, that he has met with uh, preachers uh, from several denominations uh, uh, over in Etowah County. And they had a meeting, and what they are in prayer for is planning, is bringing a Billy Graham type crusade to Alabama. Uh, the uh, evangelists will be Billy Graham's grandson, Will. Uh, and now, now you know about as much about that as I do. But you could, you could hear uh, the passion in his voice uh, talking about how our country and specifically our county and our, our town here could, could use that type of event, uh, reaching people. Uh, that's still in the planning stages right now. Uh, they're, they're actually looking to do something indoors. And I think the main reason for that is simply because of the weather. Uh, but uh, I would ask that you be in prayer for that uh, Billy Graham crusade coming to gas and they're thinking maybe later this year early next year but they're going to have several in Alabama but one of them specifically will be in Gadsden, Edwall County area so I would just ask you to be in prayer for that uh, I know that, uh, that I grew up watching Billy Graham crusades I just wanted to add we didn't they were in my unspoken prayers certainly I, I, I know uh, um, I think well oh, I didn't know I hadn't heard that wow Okay. So we'll remember those, and uh, uh, you know what hospital she's in. Uh, you know which one she's in. Well, she's out. There. Oh, she is. Oh, she just has been. Okay. All right. Well, at least we can send her a card and let her know we're thinking about her. But I just invite you to uh, to join with in prayer for for all those things that were mentioned. Certainly. Um. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting uh, to me, uh, and, it, and it's, it's encouraging uh, as well uh, when, when people say something about a sermon uh, that I had presented and, uh, you know, just kind of following up on, on last week's uh, message. 
Uh, I wanted to share with you a couple things that were on, on, on my heart and, and uh, dealing with struggles in our lives. And, and, and I chose this as one of the scriptures for today. I'm going to read it, a couple of other ones, I think. And, uh, you know, this is a very popular uh, story from scripture. Uh, it's in the other gospels. And uh, in Matthew, it's presented right after uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus uh, heals many people, goes to Peter's house. And heals her, and then it's uh, uh, right after Jesus uh, tells one of the teachers of the law, uh, who says that uh, he would follow Jesus wherever he would go. And Jesus said, "Foxes have holes, and birds of the fair of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head." And it's interesting that right after that. Uh, they put out to sea. Now they could have walked where they were going, but uh, to get away from the crowds, Jesus goes out into a boat, and they head across the lake. And this storm comes up, and uh, I don't know about you, but when I was, I think I was nine or ten years old, the movie Titanic came out, and. Uh, watching that thing flip over upside down and all the people drown. Uh, it wasn't Titanic. It was uh, the Poseidon Adventure. I'm sorry. Uh, anyways, it was about a boat flipping over. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I can remember that, boy, that was a exciting movie boy but it just it gave me nightmares for a long time and you know so I can kind of relate to this this story uh, I've been out in a couple of fishing boats where storms popped up out of nowhere and gets a little iffy sometimes I, I mean I've I've seen it where the waves where I was looking straight at waves that had fishing I mean eight ten foot swells and it uh, uh, I, I, I can relate uh, to what the disciples were feeling. You know, and they go and they wake Jesus up and they say, Lord, save us. You know, we're, we're in trouble. Uh, I can remember saying a prayer or two, saying, Lord, if you can just get that, get that beach in sight, you know, maybe at least I can swim there. But uh, needless to say, this was a troubling time, a struggle that they were going through. And uh, it just, it's just a reminder to me, and, and you've heard me confess this so many times, that during the dark times of my life when I had the struggles, when I was going through a storm like this, you know, calling on the name of Jesus. And, and, and just like he, he did in this scripture, he did the exact same thing in my life. Uh, maybe not exactly and maybe not as quickly as I'd warned him to, but, but he did the exact same things here. And, and this story is, is a reminder to me and to each one of us that we should never be without hope. That as long as we have Jesus, uh, it's a comfort. Now, I'm not a singer. But uh, but I know that you y'all you, uh, I think y'all saw the McCamies a couple weeks ago. Uh, they've got a song, and I don't know if they sang it or not. Uh, Sometimes he calms the storm. And the chorus of that song says, uh, "Sometimes he calms the storm. Sometimes he calms me. Sometimes the storm still rages on, but I feel the sweetest peace." It's such a joy to know that my Lord knows just what I need. Sometimes he calms the storm. Sometimes he calms me. Uh, in our scripture lesson today, Jesus did exactly what he said in the, in the psalm. He calmed the storm. 
I mean, I just, I just think that is just, I, I, that just blows my mind that Jesus could just think it or waved his hand or snapped his fingers or whatever he did to actually cause it to happen, but, but the storm just laid down. And I can just imagine seeing that water just slick as glass. Every now and then on Sunday mornings, I drive down Horton Bend Road from the bridge and I look out there, and a lot of times uh, that water is just calm and slick like glass. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's a little rough, some, sometimes it's moving. But that's just what I imagine this lake to look like after Jesus woke up. See, in this situation, Jesus calmed the storm. Uh, and it really doesn't matter whether he calms the storm or he, or he calms the apostles. It's Jesus has got the solution and Jesus will see us through it, what, whatever that may be. I, uh, I'm reminded of a couple other stories. And... Uh, One of them that came to my mind, and uh, heard this mentioned a couple times in the last few weeks. See, there was a king in Babylon named Nebuchadnezzar, and he set up this gold obelisk, ninety feet tall, nine feet wide, and he required all the people of the land that when they heard the music, the flutes, the lyres, the bells, the trumpets, whenever they heard the music, they were to bow down and, and worship this big statue that, that he had created in honor of him. Well, they had these, uh, what they called astrologers, fortune tellers, palm readers. They, uh, they came to the king and they said, hey, there's some Jews over here they aren't doing what you said. They're not bowing down when they hear the music. So, uh, needless to say, that uh, a king gets angry when people don't do what he says. You know, I, I, I remind Mary Jean all the time of this famous line from a movie that we like that, how's this thing going to work if you don't do what I say? Kevin Costner told Annette Benning in, uh, in a popular western that, that, that we like to watch from time to time. A lot of good words in there. I thought that was kind of interesting. But, but old uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he was, he was thinking the same thing. How's this thing going to work if, you, if all you Jews don't do what I say? You know, that, he had a solution for that. We all know what it was, I think. So furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shad Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these Jews were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was even more angry. And... Uh, just in a way that I can understand it. He, uh, he had all the folks stoke that fire. And he had them, got the fire blazing. 
seven times hotter than it normally was. And he sent the three Hebrew children into the furnace. And I think this is really interesting, this, this part. He, uh, King said this. He said, they replied, Oh, certainly, King, when asked if the three had been sent into the fire. And King said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, you've got to understand, Nebuchadnezzar was pagan. He wasn't a believer. He didn't know who Jesus was. But all general consensus is that the fourth person that the king saw in the fire along with the three Hebrew children was Jesus himself. And we know that they came out of the fire and were saved. I, I, I can't imagine what what that would be like. But what, what I read in Scripture here is in nowhere, in, in, in none of the writings here, does, does it show any excitement, any anxiety, no regret, no fear in the attitude and the actions of the three Hebrew children. You know, they knew what was fixing to happen to them. They were fixing to be put into this incredibly hot, fiery furnace. I mean, I, I can't even st stand getting too close to our fireplace. I can't imagine jumping in it and walking around it. Clarence, you worked at the steel plant, didn't you? I mean, you, you've been next to those furnaces. I mean, it's, I'd say it's probably pretty similar to that. I mean, and I tell you, and, and, and in today's day and time, a mortal human being is not going into that furnace and walking out of it. The only way it could possibly happen is by the hand of God. And in this instance, this instance, God didn't calm the storm. I mean, the storm was, was blazing, about as hot as it could be. But he calmed the participants. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, walked through it. And, 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 and I would have to think, you know, if I'm walking into that fight, if I'm one of those three guys, I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm fixing to go meet God right now. Now, they may have a lot more faith than I do. I, I, I don't know. Not that judge. But the fact of the matter is they walked in there and they, whatever the outcome, if we make it, if we don't make it, he says, everyone will know that there is a God in Israel. God calmed the three Hebrew children. In another similar situation, uh, I want to think back to King David. Right after he was uh, anointed as the future king, Goliath stood before the, the armies of Israel, and they were scared. I mean, they, were, they were terrified. How in the world could we ever beat this guy? Nine feet tall, wore armor that weighed 125 pounds. And I think it's real interesting that they brought out these points. But just the tip of his spear, the tip of the spear was 15 pounds. That was three five-pound bags of sugar on the end of that spear. 
I mean, you had to be some kind of a man to handle that. So here was David, just a boy. He discards all of King Saul's armor and weapons that he gave him. And he goes out to meet Goliath. And he looked David over and he saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and a spear, sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord God will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give your carcasses, give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole earth, whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you over to our hands. And you know, after David said these words, he rushed toward the Philistine, pulled the stone out of his pouch, put it in his sling, spun it around a few times, and flung the rock, sunk into the Philistine's forehead and killed it. He went over and somehow or another he, he grabbed that sword out of the scabbard. It was probably as tall as he was. And he cut off Goliath's head. And you know nowhere in this does it give us any inclination whatsoever that David got the least bit excited. Doesn't say anything about his heart rate getting up at all. He just calmly told King Saul that no, I don't need that, that armor. I don't need your weapons. All I need is this sling and these stones in my pouch. See, as David walked directly into the fiery furnace called Goliath, God had calmed the storm in him. He had calmed David. David walked there. I, you know, I think he just walked up there with all the confidence in the world. I don't think he had any it's just a supernatural occurrence when the power of God comes over you. I wish I could explain to you what that was exactly what, but that's what I believe in my heart is that the presence of God, the power of the Holy Spirit anointed David and I think he walked up there with no trepidation whatsoever. God calmed him. You know, I, I know that there have been a lot of times in my life when I've been in situations of adversity and I, I can remember just my voice cracking, my butterflies in my stomach, my hands shaking. Just, I was just a nervous wreck. I don't think David was like that at all. I think and I believe that David was as calm as a cucumber. He walked up there 100% confident that Goliath would fall at his hands. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, it, it seems like, and it just seems like there's just more and more tough times going on in our world, in our lives with our friends, with ourselves. Now, I'm not saying this at all to uh, 
to brag on myself. But, but I know that there are times when, when I can lose my patience. And I get excited. And, and I get upset. And my wife tells me that I don't have a good poker face. <clears throat> I think I shared this with you a while back, but we went to, I, I, I believe it with Jack. And, and we placed a big order for some reason. I don't remember what it was. And uh, I, I could tell that this person uh, was struggling. Maybe it was their first day. But i tell you, it was a Saturday and it was busy and it was just a lot going on. And, uh, and we probably sat at that window for 10 minutes. And... Uh, you know, and I, and I can remember just sitting there just as, as calm as, as, as I could be. And I, and I just, my heart poured out for that person. You know, and to my knowledge, I don't recall saying one off uh, thing that would, I, I, I mean, I wasn't frustrated. I just kind of just, I was just calm through it all. Now, that, that's not like a storm like what we were reading in the scripture at all, but that was just a, a time when I felt God's peace in my life. Um, last time we went to Costco, we in, I had to buy a bunch of stuff for work, and we ended up with two big grocery carts full of stuff. You know, paper towel and toilet paper and all that kind of water and, and everything. And I always go through, if there's a guy there named Rod, and I don't know Rod's last name, but if Rod is working there, I'll go through the longest line to let him check us out because he's such a great guy. And Rod was over there working and we went through and he had this person, they usually have some person helping him unload the cart, loading the, neck, loading the cart to get out of there. And this person was struggling. Uh, probably their first day on the job. Normally, you go through Rod's line and it's just zip, 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 zip. Well, man, I'll tell you what, this took for a long time. And, uh, and, and I sat there and I watched Rod be patient with this person who was obviously struggling. And, uh, and you know, and I said, uh, he, he asked me, he goes, how's your wife doing? And I said, well, she had to go over there and sit down. Her knee's bothering. She's having surgery. He said, write her name down. And write the date down. She's having surgery. And I said, okay. And he goes, I go to so-and-so church, and he goes, we're going to pray for her on Sunday. And he goes, we're going to pray for her the day she has her surgery. You know, and, and I tell you, I, I saw the calmness in Rod that comes from having a relationship with Jesus Christ and having God be the Lord of your life. And I thought that uh, that, that was just really special. So, as, as, we, as we go through the next days of our life, let's remember uh, that whatever it is we're going through, that God can get us through. Whether he calms the storm and makes it go away, or whether he gives us the patience and the calmness to endure the storm.